Welcome. Our topic is all about alkenes and alkynes. This time, we will begin our study of unsaturated hydrocarbons. We can recall in my previous lecture that these unsaturated carbons contain one or more carbon-carbon double bonds, triple bonds, and or benzene-like rings. Alkenes are hydrocarbon that contains one or more carbon-carbon double bonds. And the simplest alkene, which is readily available in the environment or from the nature, is ethylene. And this ethylene is abundant, particularly in plant parts that is usually for plant growth regulator. And this ethylene is also important in fruit ripening. That is why in some other um, areas in the Philippines, they use um, kakawati leaves in ripening their bananas because the kakawati leaves contains much amount of ethylene for ripening also we have the alkyne which is a hydrocarbon that contains one or more carbon carbon triple bonds and the simplest alkyne is acetylene and the difference between the two the alkene and the alkyne alkene has double bonds and alkyne has triple bonds just like what we have here in the illustration um, the ball and stick and the lewis structure of simple alkene which is ethylene and acetylene which is alkyne um, using of course the VSEPR model we can predict bond angles of 120 degrees about each carbon and a double bond so the observed H bonded to C and C angle is in ethylene um, for example is 121.7 degrees which is close to the predicted value, which is 120 degrees. In other alkenes, deviations from the predicted angle of 120 degrees may be somewhat larger because of the interactions between the alkyl groups bonded to the doubly bonded carbons. So the C bonded to another C and another C bond angle is propene or in propene for example here is 124.7 degrees if we look at into the molecular level of ethylene we see that the two carbons of the double bond the two carbons of the double bond and the four hydrogens bonded to them all lie in the same plane that is ethylene is a flat or planar molecule furthermore chemists have discovered that under normal conditions no rotation is possible about the carbon carbon double bond of ethylene or for that matter of any other alkene that means no more rotation is possible into it whereas free rotation occurs about each carbon carbon single bond in an alkene um, rotation about the carbon carbon double bond in an alkene does not normally take place for an important exception to this um, generalization about carbon-carbon double bonds, we will look into the cis and the trans isomerism in vision. 
because of the restricted rotation about a carbon-carbon double bond, an alkene in which each carbon of the double bond has two different groups bonded to it that shows the cis and the trans isomerisms. In this illustration here, in cis 2-butene, the two methyl groups are located on the same side of the double bond and the two hydrogens are on the other side. Also, let's look into the structure of trans 2-butene where the two methyl are located on opposite sides of the double bond. So the cis and the trans butene are different compounds and have different physical and chemical properties. Thus here, it indicates the melting point of the cis to butene which is 139 degrees Celsius or negative 139 degrees Celsius and the boiling point is 4 degrees Celsius, which is far different from the melting point of trans 2-butene, which is negative 106 degrees Celsius, and the boiling point, which is 1 degrees Celsius. Alkenes and alkynes are named during or using the IOPAC names or the IOPAC system of nomenclature. As well as we see, some are still referred to by their common names. The same also with alkanes, we have IOPAC names of alkenes. So the key to the IOPAC system of naming alkenes is the ending E and E. Just as the ending A and E tells us the hydrocarbon chain contains only carbon-carbon single bonds. So the ending E and E tells us that it contains a carbon-carbon double bond. To name an alkene, we have several rules to follow. Um, number one, of course, find the longest carbon chain that includes the double bond. You indicate the length of the parent chain by using the prefix that tells the number of carbon atoms in it and the suffix ene -E to show that it has or it is an alkene. Second, number the chain from the end that gives the lower set of numbers to the carbon atoms of the double bond. You designate the position of the double bond by the number of its first carbon. For branch chain alkenes, they are named in a manner which is similar to alkenes, substituent or yeah, substituent groups are located and named. Just like for example, in this slide. We have three examples of the alkene. So first, here, it is very simple. We will locate only the longest chain, and this is the longest chain. It does not have branch at all. So since it has six carbons, then therefore it is hexene because the double bond is located in the carbon number 1. Thus, we name it 1-hexene. On the another example here, it is named as 4-methyl-1-hexene. 4-methyl because um, the methyl substituent is located in the carbon number 4. 1-hexene because the double bond is located in the number one carbon of the longest chain, which is hexene. Lastly, this is a branched 
um, alkene. Note that although 2,3-diethyl-1-pentene has a 6-carbon chain, the longest chain that contains the double bond has only 5 carbons. So the parent alkene is therefore a pentene rather than a hexene. And the molecule is named as a distributed 1-pentene. Now, the key to a Yopak name of an alkyne is the ending Y and E, which shows the presence of a carbon-carbon triple bond. Thus, the CH triple bond is bonded to CH in the ethyne, um, which is acetylene or the simplest alkyne. In higher alkynes, on the other hand, number the longest carbon chain that contains the triple bond from the end that gives the lower set of numbers to the triply bonded carbons. Indicate the location of the triple bond by the number of its first carbon atom. For example, we have here 3-methyl-1-butyne. It is butyne because of the four carbons, but, and Y and E that gives us an idea that this is a compound with triple bond. Where is the location of the triple bond? It is located in the carbon number 1. And we have the substituent, which is the methyl here, the CH3. Where the CH3 is attached in the carbon number 3. Thus, the name 3-methyl-1-butyne. On this example here, it's 6 6 dimethyl 3 heptyne it's heptine because it, the longest um, chain containing triple bond is composed of seven carbons. And the, double, uh, the triple bond is located in the carbon number three. While we have two substituents here, two methyls, thus we use it dimethyl. And that dimethyl is located in the sixth carbon, giving the name 6,6-dimethyl-3-heptyne. For the common names, despite the precision and universal acceptance of the IOPAC nomenclature, some alkanes and alkynes are particularly those of low molecular weight are known almost exclusively by their common names. Giving these three examples here, the ethylene, the propylene, and the isobutylene. So, in ethylene, it is ethylene because eth, it has two carbons, and your propylene, because prop, it has three carbons. And this one we have isobutylene because it has four carbons. Another, we have the IOPAC name of the alkyne, which is ethyne, which is the simplest alkyne, which is your acetylene. We have the propyne or the methyl acetylene for the common name, and two butyne or the dimethyl acetylene. Further, in common names of uh, alkynes, we derive common names for these alkynes by prefixing the name of the substituents on the carbon-carbon triple bond to the name acetylene. Thus, we have acetylene, methyl acetylene, and dimethyl acetylene. How about in naming cycloalkenes? 
to name a cycloalkene, we need to have um, number the carbon atoms of the ring, double bond 1 and 2 in the direction that gives the lower number to the substituent encountered first. And also number and list substituents in alphabetical order. Just like for example, in this 3-methylcyclopentene. So, we identify the two bonds or yeah, two bonds here, the double bonds with uh, number 1 and number 2 here. It is named as 3-methylcyclopentene because it is cyclic with five carbons with double bond and the nearest um, substituent which is methyl is located in the methyl I mean in the carbon number three also in this illustration um, for ethyl one methyl cyclohexene your four ethyl because this is ethyl attached in carbon number four and your methyl which is attached in your carbon number one of the compound particularly in the ring number um, one and two carbon of the ring how about dienes trienes and polyenes um, alkenes that contain more than one double bond are named as alkadienes, alkatrienes, and so on. So, those that contain several double bonds are preferred or referred to more generally as polyenes. These are example of dienes because it has two double bonds. One for pentadiene, penta because it has five carbons, and diene because two double bonds. It is one four because it is in carbon number one and in carbon number four. If we assign number one here, one, two, three, four, five. Or maybe we can assign also number one here, one, two, three, four, five. It's just the same. This one, it's 2-methyl-1,3-butadiene. Um, this 2-methyl, because it's in the carbon number 2, and 1,3-butadiene, because it's in carbon number 1 and carbon number 3. This one is 1,3-cyclopentadiene, because it has 5 carbons, in a cyclic structure and the double bonds are located in the carbon number one and carbon number three. In terms of physical properties of alkenes and alkynes, alkenes and alkynes are nonpolar compounds and the only attractive um, forces between their molecules are very weak London dispersion forces. So their physical properties, therefore, are similar to those of the alkanes with the same carbon skeletons. Alkanes and alkynes that are liquid at room temperature have the density less than one gram per ml. So that is why they float on water. They are also insoluble in water but soluble in one another and in other nonpolar organic liquids. Among the compounds found in essential oils of plants are the group of substances called terpenes, all of which have in common the fact that their common or carbon skeleton can be divided into two or more carbon units that are identical with five carbon skeleton of the isoprene. The carbon number one of the isoprene unit is called the head, this one, and the carbon number four is said to be 
the tail. A terpene is a compound in which the tail of one isoprene becomes bonded to the head of another isoprene unit. That means terpenes are among the most um, wild, widely distributed compounds in the biological world. And a study of their structures provides a glimpse into the wondrous diversity that nature can generate from a simple carbon skeleton. Terpenes illustrate, as what I've said earlier, an important principle of the molecular logic of living systems. Um, in building large molecules, small subunits are bonded together by a series of enzyme-catalyzed reaction and then chemically modified by additional enzyme-catalyzed reaction. These are some common example of terpenes as what you can observe on the red portion there there is the connection between two terpene units wherein the head and the tail are bonded together so let's move on the reactions of alkenes in summary we have hydrochlorination we have hydration, we have bromination, and your hydrogenation or the reduction reaction. The reaction of alkenes are most probably exothermic. That means they produce um, heat during the reaction. So just because they are exothermic, it doesn't mean um, that they occur rapidly. Reaction maybe depends on the activation energy and many alkene addition reactions require a catalyst. So the hydrogen halides or the HCl, HBr, and HI add to alkenes to give a hollow alkenes which is known also as alkyl halides. Addition of hydrogen chloride or the addition of HCl to ethylene here will yield a chloroethane. So the addition of HCl to propene gives to chloropropene or the isopropyl chloride. Hydrogen usually adds to carbon number 1 of propene here in the carbon number 1. The hydrogen is attached and the carbon number 2 where your chlorine will attach. If the orientation of addition were reversed, one chloropropane would form. So the observed result is that almost no one chloropropane will form because two chloropropane is the observed product. We say the addition of HCl to propene is regioselective. So regioselectivity was noted by Vladimir um, Markovnikov who made the following generalization known as the Markovnikov's rule wherein the addition of HX where X is the halogen to an alkene Hydrogen will add to the doubly bonded carbon that has the greater number of hydrogens bonded to it and the halogen will bond or will add to the other carbon with lesser hydrogen. Chemists account for the addition of HX 
to an alkene by defining a two-step reaction mechanism which we illustrate for the reaction of 2-butene with hydrogen chloride to give 2-chlorobutane. The step one here is the addition of hydrogen to 2-butene. To show this addition, we use the curve arrow that shows the repositioning of an electron pair from its origin, wherein the tail of the arrow. And to its new location, which is the head of the arrow. Recall that we use curve arrows in our um, previous lectures to show bond breaking and bond formation in proton transfer reactions. We know uh, now that we use curve arrows in the same way to show bond breaking and bond formation in a reaction mechanism. So the step one results in the formation of an or, um, organic cation. One carbon atom in this cation has only six electrons in its valence shell. So it is um, carried um, by a charge of positive one. So the species containing positive, um, positively charged carbon is called the carbocation, meaning carbon plus cation. So carbocations are classified as primary and secondary and or maybe tertiary depending on the number of the carbon groups bonded to the carbon bearing the positive charge. So in step 1, reaction of carbon-carbon double bond with H plus gives a secondary carbocation intermediate, which is this one. And the step 2, reaction of the carbocation intermediate, which is this product, reacts to chloride ion, will complete the addition, forming 2-chlorobutane. Another reaction is the addition of water or we call it acid catalyzed hydration because in the presence of acid cat catalysts, most commonly concentrated sulfuric acid or the H2SO4, water adds to the carbon-carbon double bond for an alkene to give an alcohol. That means, if we add water to an alkene in the presence of sulfuric acid, it will form an alcohol. Addition of water is called as hydration. In the case of simple alkenes, hydration follows again the Markovnikov's rule where hydrogen of water adds to the carbon of the double bond with greater number of hydrogen while the OH of the water adds to the carbon with smaller number of hydrogens. Another reaction is addition of chlorine and bromine. So chlorine and bromine react with alkenes at room temperature by addition of halogen atoms to the carbon atoms of the double bond. This reaction is generally carried out either by using the pure reagents or by mixing them in an inert solvent such as the dichloromethane which is CH2Cl2, this one. Addition of bromine 
is useful qualitative test for the presence of an alkene or I mean the presence of carbon-carbon double bond. If we dissolve bromine in carbon tetrachloride, the solution is red. In contrast, alkenes and dibromoalkenes are colorless. If we mix a few drops of the red bromine solution with an unknown sample suspected of being an alkene, there will be disappearance of the red color as bromine adds to the double bond tells us that an alkene is indeed present. Another reaction of alkene is the addition of hydrogen or also known as the reduction reaction. Virtually, all alkenes react quantitatively with molecular hydrogen in the presence of course of a transition metal catalyst um, commonly used transition metal catalyst includes platinum palladium nickel and uh, ruthenium because the conversion of an alkene to an alkane involves reduction by hydrogen in the presence of these catalysts, the process is called catalytic reduction or alternatively catalytic hydrogenation. Observe these reactions here. We have trans-2-butene will react to hydrogen with the catalyst palladium will give us a byproduct which is an alkane this is butane also high cyclohexene will react to hydrogen in the presence of uh, or with the presence of your palladium as the catalyst will form a cyclohexane which is an alkane now we have the term polymerization. This polymerization is actually from the perspective of organic chemical industry, the single most important reaction of alkenes is this, polymerization. Um, polymerization, of course, we have the term polymer, which is from the Greek word poly and meros. Poly, that means many and meros meaning part. And the monomer from the Greek word mono meaning single and meros meaning part. So that means a single part, the monomer. So for example, we have here the ethylene will undergo polymerization. It will form a polyethylene. Um, in polyriz polymerization, um, it shows the structure of a polymer by placing parentheses here, parentheses around the repeating monomer unit. So, assuming this is the repeating monomer unit. And the subscript, which is the N, outside the parentheses, will indicate the number of units nga that will repeat your monomer unit. So the structure of a polymer chain can be reproduced by repeating this enclosed structure in both direction, either this direction or this direction. And following a section of the polypropene or the polypropylene, this one, part of an extended polymer chain. So in this um, line angle formula, the monomer units shown in color red. So they are attached with one another in a repeating unit to form a poly polymer. These are the monomer formula with their common name and their polymer names and common uses. 
um, I guess this is uh, the most common. We have the PVC for construction tubing. We have also here the styrofoams, um, which is needed for insulation and at the same time for packaging. And there are other um, polymers that are very useful in our daily lives. We have also the LDPE and the HDPE. When we say LDPE, it's low density polyethylene and um, HDPE is high density polyethylene. So these polyethylenes here differ with one another. Um, a low density polyethylene is a highly branched polymer where the polymer chains do not pack well and London dispersion forces between them are very weak. And usually, they are softens and melts above 115 degrees Celsius. And approximately 65% used for the production of films for packaging and for trash bags. While HDPE or high density polyethylene, um, only minimal chain branching, but the chains are packed well and the London dispersion forces between them are strong. And usually, because of that strong connections, strong um, attractions, there ha they has the higher melting point than LDPE and is stronger and can be blow molded for squeezable jugs and bottles. This last slide here um, gives us an idea of the different codes for plastics. Um, as what we observe, we have the PET here, uh, which is um, very important in soft drink bottles, household chemical bottles, films, textile fibers. We have here the HDPE, for water jugs, grocery bags, quizable bottles. We have the V or the polyvinyl or the PVC which is in shampoo bottles, pipes, shower curtains, wire insulation, floor tiles. We have also the low density polyethylene or the LDPE. These are shrinkable wrap, trash and grocery bags, sandwich bags, squeeze bottles. We have also the PP, the number 5, which is the polypropylene, which plastic leads, um, clothing fibers, bottle cups, toys, and diaper linings. We have also the PS, which is the polystyrene, which is most probably we have the styrofoam cups. And there are other plastics that are um, available in the market as of now. But um, I would like to give you some inputs and concerns regarding with these polymers, um, particularly these plastics. These plastics are very um, toxic to our environment because these plastics are non-biodegradable. And there are some plastics are, that are turned into pieces, into smaller pieces and... Uh, uh, up to the extent that we cannot um, observe this in uh, using our naked eyes. And these are called as your microplastics. And these microplastics go to our water reservoirs. We may be able to intake these microplastics and cause um, danger to our health. And this ends my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Hoping that you learned a lot in our session. God bless everyone.